Exam two is Thursday. And Wednesday night, if you prefer. So that would be three, five. Uh, day class is Thursday, three, six. And the topics are temperature and kinetic theory. But if you, if you don't know what the topics are yet, you might as well just, I mean, you, you might be better off just going in fresh. Like, don't start studying now, I would say. <laughs> the walrus stuff is not on this desk. <laughs> temperature and kinetic theory and heat. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, as many questions as people have related to the test. And then after that, we're going to go on to the new topic. The second topic, so we've already done one full topic that uh, isn't, you know, that won't be on this test and going on to the next one. The next one is great because it's the heart of the class. We're going to start talking about electricity and magnetism. Anybody have any questions on practice problems or uh, any of the subjects related to the test? Okay. Okay, good. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Well, I just updated the equation sheet like yesterday, and those are on there now. There were a couple missing, and so I put those two on. There were a couple more that were missing, but it, it's at least better now. Um, so, yeah, if you, um, it's in the D2L news. It says it's updated, so if you want to print out a new version of the equation sheet, uh, each time I update it, it gets better. Um. <laughs> okay. So will that be the equation sheet then for the exam? Well, I'll just copy the relevant equations from that sheet. So I won't I won't give you the full two pages or whatever, but any constants will be given, yeah. Um oh one thing that uh I didn't Someone last night during the night class asked me to just mention this. Um, there's one of the practice problems that says something. You'll see when you get to the practice problems, Katie, that there's, <laughs> that there's one that says um, that uh, I think it's for oxygen maybe. It gives a constant volume specific heat, and then it gives a constant pressure specific heat. And it doesn't really say anything about it. And that's not something you really have to understand, but all you have to know is um, for gases, the specific heat, so for solids and liquids, specific heat is uh, consistent no matter what you're doing with them. But for gases, the specific heat changes depending on what kind of process you have. And so specific heats are usually given for two types of processes. Um, so like if you look it up, you know, Google it or, um, or look it up in a table. Um, for gases, the specific heat are usually given for two process types. Um, constant volume, so an isovolumetric process, uh, <clears throat> and that's called C sub V, and then uh, constant pressure, so uh, that's an isobaric process, and that one's called C sub P. Um, and out of all the processes that go on, in the world, uh, what percentage of those processes are made up of 
isovolumetric and isobaric processes would you guess, roughly? Zero. Um, so remember that always, like the way we treat any kind of process, we have those four process types, and you have to remember that those are approximations, and we're always just choosing the one that's the best approximation of what we have. Nothing is truly isovolumetric, truly isobaric. Those are just approximations. Okay, so same thing here. I mean, really, I don't know that this is true, but my guess is that uh, that specific heat is the most different between constant volume and constant pressure, and that's why um, those are the two that are given. They sort of bracket the, the ranges that you have, you know. But on a test, I won't, you won't have to know any of that stuff. I'll just give you the one that's relevant, you know. Um, any other questions? I, that wasn't even a question anyone asked. I just did that myself. Um, okay, so now let's talk about electricity. Um, so eventually, uh, we'll want to talk about the relationship. So we'll get to the relationship between electricity and magnetism. Um, this relationship is what makes electromagnetic waves possible. And uh, some of the things that are electromagnetic waves are um, light, heat radiation, um, x-rays, radio waves. I'm sure there's a lot of other important ones, but... Um, a lot of important stuff depends on this relationship between electricity and magnetism. Maybe most important to us is uh, without radiation of heat, um, Earth wouldn't get any energy from the sun and there'd be no life. So, I mean, as importance as important things go, that's up there, you know. Um, okay, so electricity. Um, electricity deals with the motion of charged particles. Um, and to understand charged particles, you have to understand roughly what an atom looks like. Um, so an atom, uh, so here's just a very simple uh, picture of what an, an atom's structure looks like. Um, in the middle, you have... Uh, protons and neutrons. Um, you can have more than one of each. And all together, the protons and neutrons are called the nucleus. And then spinning around the outside are 
electrons. Um, and by the way, this picture is nowhere near to scale. Um, if you, uh, I can't remember the example, but um, like really the nucleus, if, if the nucleus is like the size of a ball, you know, the electrons are really out near the, the borders of Minneapolis, you know, like um, there's, an atom is a lot more space than it is stuff, you know. Um, and in a way that, uh, do you remember when we were talking about monatomic and non, yeah, you, I hope you remember because we have a test on that. So monatomic and non-monatomic gases, there's a big, there's an important distinction between those, right? And that important distinction comes from the fact that with monatomic gases, essentially no kinetic energy is made up of rotational motion, right? And I mentioned just in passing that uh, the reason um, the reason non or the reason that monatomic um, gas molecules um, don't have much rotational kinetic energy is because they don't have nearly as much length as monatomic particles. Like the mass is all essentially in one spot, whereas for non-monatomic particles, the mass is spread out. And that's why non-monatomic molecules have rotational energy and monatomic don't. Well, if you think of it this way anyways, the nucleus is where essentially all the mass of an atom is. So if you have, if you just have a molecule made up of a single atom, its mass is, a picture its mass being the size of a ball, its electrons are way far away, but they don't really have any mass compared to the protons and the neutrons. So essentially all of its mass is where a ball is. Now picture two of those atoms connected by their, they're connected by the electrons, you know. So you have one ball that's in downtown St. Paul, that's half of its mass, and the other ball is in downtown Minneapolis. That mass is spread very far apart compared to the one atom that, that's mass is just the size of a ball. Can you sort of picture what I mean? And, and so it's not just a matter of doubling the length or something. It's a matter of just a huge, huge difference in, in how far apart the mass is spread out. And that's why there's a huge difference in um, uh, the, the energy tied up in rotational motion for non-monatomic particles compared to in monatomic particles. Interesting, right? OK, good. Um, OK, we say um, protons have a positive charge. And electrons have a negative charge. Um, neutrons don't have any charge. They're neutral. Um, So this is arbitrary, that we call protons positive and neutrons negative. Um, in fact, it, uh, it's residual from when people first were trying to understand how charges worked, and it turned out they were wrong. They got it backwards. But people had come up with so many ways to calculate things by that time, it, it was never worth the huge effort to switch things. Um, but even though it's arbitrary, um, The idea 
of so um, the idea of charge represented by sign uh, makes good sense. So think about this. What um, what if instead of calling charge positive and negative, we called it red and blue? You know, um, that's still a distinction, and um, you could still say red and blue things attract each other, red and red things repel, blue and blue repel. So is there any benefit to saying that this is that sign is positive and negative as opposed to red and blue or some other? It turns out there is, and it has to do with the math of combining charges. Um, combining charges has the effect of adding their numerical charges. So um, for example, um, if you had uh, a 5 times 10 to the minus 20, say this is positive charge. Next to uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 20, say that one's also positive charge next to a negative 4 times 10 to the minus 20 charge. Um, the total charge, if you measured the total charge, you'd get what you get from adding these up. Um, so uh, positive 3 times 10 to the minus 20 charge. OK, so that wouldn't work if you just called it red and blue. And there are things that, um, like there in complicated modern physics, there's all sorts of stuff that uh, there's no known relationships like this. And they call the two different, um, they call the two different sides. Uh, there's one that they call strange and charm. Those are the two. <laughs> like there's all this just so, such weird stuff. But this positive and negative makes sense because this additional math works. Okay. Um, the SI unit for charge is the Coulomb. That's someone's name. Uh, you abbreviate it capital C. Um, the charge of an electron is negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And the charge of a proton is positive 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So uh, the charges are identical, just opposite of each other. And that has to do with the fact that a proton is, uh, I forget how they combine, but they're, they sort of combine in a way to, um, uh, so, well, like a neutron and an electron, in a way, combine to produce. A, a neutron and a anti-electron combine to produce a proton. So... There's a reason that they have equal and opposite signs. 
And that's also the reason that neutrons and protons have essentially the same mass, while an electron has a very tiny mass compared to both of them. Um, like signed uh, particles repel each other. And opposite signed particles attract each other. Um, so electron, an electron and a proton attract each other. Two protons repel each other. Um, and the amount of attraction or repulsion, so the strength of the attractive or repulsive force, so the attraction and the repulsion both uh, go according to the same equation, um, are given by Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's law says F is equal to K um, times the charge of one in absolute value times the charge of the other one in absolute value divided by R squared, uh, where K is a constant equal to 8.988 times 10 to the ninth, and the, Newton, uh, the uh, units are Newton meters squared over Coulomb squared, and R is the distance between the two particles. This is going to be an important equation. And um, F is the force. That, and that force is either pulling them together or, or pushing them apart, depending on the signs of the two particles. Um, so. Here's a question. Um, compared to the electrical um, charges in our daily experience, so maybe think of like static electricity um, or, you know, uh, the uh, positive and negative terminals of a battery, say, okay? Um, in our everyday experience, is a Coulomb big or small? Um, so a Newton, you know, you know, if there's a weight force of a, you know, if you have something in your hand that has a weight of one Newton, it's small, like you notice it, but it's no trouble picking it up or whatever. Um, a joule of energy is fairly small. You know, we eat 8 million joules of food calories a day. So what about a Coulomb? Uh, how does a Coulomb compare to um, the charge that uh, goes from your hand to a doorknob in an electrical shock or something? Well, we can use Coulomb's law to sort of get at that. So let's think of 
Um, think of a positive 1 Coulomb charge held 1 meter from a negative 1 Coulomb charge. Let's calculate the force and figure out is this something that you could, you know, could you just hold these two things like this? Or would two people have to, you know, be pulling on them or two trucks have to be pulling on them or what, you know, um, in order to keep them from jumping together because these two opposite signs are going to make these things want to attract. Um, so if you have uh, a plus one Coulomb charge here and a negative one Coulomb charge here and the distance between them is one meter, uh, what's the magnitude of the attractive force? Coulomb's law says the force is equal to 8.988 times 10 to the ninth. The absolute value of this charge is 1. The absolute value of this charge is 1. The distance between them is 1 meter, so that's squared. And so you get a force of 8.988 times 10 to the ninth newtons. Um, so 9 billion newtons. Um, so a Coulomb is huge, you know. Uh, So most of the charges that we're going to be talking about are going to be small fractions of a Coulomb. Um, yeah, uh, so that's a good question. Uh, this is a good thing to keep in mind. All of the SI units are just... In a way, it's a very simple thing to sort of keep in your mind. All the SI units are units that can be made out of meters, kilograms, and seconds. And so a Coulomb, um, if you look at the units, uh, a Coulomb squared is equal to, uh, well, you can't really do it from this. Um, Joules. It, it's not popping into my head right now, like what a like how you have to combine units to get um, to get a coulomb. But um, you know, like a newton is made up of kilogram, meters, seconds. Um, every unit can be made up of a combination of those, and the smallness or bigness of these units just has to do with how they combine. You know. Um, one thing that I'm going to talk about a lot is uh, I'm going to talk about test charges and fixed charges. Um, the test charge is always the chosen object. Um, in other words, you know, it's the object that you would draw the free body diagram of. So 
you draw the free body diagram of the test charge um, to use Newton's second law. Okay, so like in the example I just did, um, let's say a uh, so let me rewrite the example that I just did. Um, and let's say that a positive 1 Coulomb test charge is 1 meter to the left of a minus 1 Coulomb fixed charge. What's the force vector acting on the test charge? So really, this is the same question. I'm just being more specific about which one is our isolated object. And so in this sense, we just had a vague um, you know, we know that they're being attracted. We know the magnitude of the attraction is this. But what's the direction of the force vector? Well, it depends on which one you're isolating. If you're isolating, um, if you're isolating this one, then the force vector is this way. If you're isolating this one, then the force vector is that way. Okay. So this talking about something as being the test charge is a way to actually talk about force vectors instead of just uh, generally being attracted or generally being repelled. Um, so in this case, uh, we know that the force magnitude is equal to 8.988 times 10 to the ninth uh, newtons. A free body diagram of the test charge looks like this, the magnitude is 8.988 times 10 to the ninth. Um, so if we have our standard coordinate system like this, then the force vector is positive 8.988 times 10 to the ninth newtons in the x direction, zero in the y direction. Um, And if instead I had said that a minus 1 Coulomb test charge is 1 meter to the right of the positive 1, the free body diagram would have the force going the other direction, and the force, the x component of the force would be negative. Okay. Okay, so um, let's say that you have a fixed charge of plus one Coulomb and a test charge of one single electron um, at the location shown. So uh, here is the plus one Coulomb. That's the fixed charge. And let's say uh, first, here's the electron. So let's say that's part A. And then uh, this is part B, where this distance is. So part B, they're really close together. Part A, let's say that they're um, one meter apart. For part B, let's say that they're uh, 
uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 8 meters apart. And let's figure out what these forces are. So for part A, um, and I didn't ask the question. So um, what are the force vectors on the test charge? Well, why don't you take a couple minutes and work through this? So um, again, let's use a, just our usual coordinate system like this and calculate those two force vectors. 